Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher, and welcome to All About Canadian Books. This week's Canadian author interview is with Dr. Anita Jack Davies, and we will find out the story become behind her forthcoming novel, Laurentia's Last Parang, a memoir of loss and belonging as a Black woman in Canada. And her book, it's a snapshot of... Um, Anita's life after her grandmother passed away, its memoir, eulogy, and an academic analysis that offers an insightful exploration of race in Canada. Welcome to All About Canadian Books, Dr. Anita Jack Davies. Thank you for having me and please call me Anita. I will. I would be honored to call you <laughs> Anita. <laughs> So Anita, we will be chatting about your grandmother today. So awesome. let's, can you tell us about her? Uh, first of all, we called her Mami. Uh, and Mami is a word that we use in the Caribbean. And you can refer to a child as Mami. So it's not the Mammy in terms of the controlling sort of image of Black women. Uh, it's Mami in the sense of this is a friend, this is someone we love. It's it's a term of, of endearment. So my Mami was, um, she was very loving. She was a great cook. So she was a foodie, but we, we didn't know about the term foodie <laughs> growing up. And I just remember she had this huge, huge, huge pot and she just made uh, all kinds of dishes but why that was important is everyone in the neighborhood knew that she was a great cook. And around dinner time, all kinds of people would be stopping in, you know, <laughs> oh, hey, mommy, how are you doing? Meanwhile, and then she's like, oh, let me fix you a plate. And I'm like, oh, right. That's why, that's why they came, right? So, so she just, she just really loved very fiercely. Mm -hmm. Um, and she wasn't shy about her love. Like she would sometimes just sit and look at me. And I knew it was just love pouring out or she would, you know, rub my head or she would just tell me, you know, you're so beautiful or I love what you're wearing or she was just always interested. Meanwhile, I thought that was just special to me. At our at the funeral, I realized she did that with all my cousins. <laughs> so, so that's when I realized that she had a special way of making us feel like we were the only I was the only person on the earth that mattered. And that was really something that I needed growing up. Oh, yeah. what a gift. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. Anita, what would your mammy think of you telling her story? Um, I think she would be surprised. Um, I think she would be humbled. She was always very humbled by things. I remember when I was in Paris for the first time and I called home and said, mommy, I'm in Paris. And she said, wow, look at where you are. Like she was just always, you know, like when I earned my PhD, she was like, wow, look at what you've earned. Like she was just always in awe on the one hand, but she always knew I could do it and was always pushing me on the other hand. So it was these gentle nudges to like, to do well. And then it was that, oh, we're just so proud of you. And I remember when um, I finished my doctorate, uh, my aunt Juliet, she went to this huge Catholic church in San Fernando and they lit candles and the priest made an announcement. I mean, it was just like having family members who really like this aunt reads all my work and just really, really interested in in what I'm doing and my grandmother and grandfather my grandfather's name is is Patrick so mm -hmm. mommy and daddy they really they really nurtured us to succeed but they also enjoyed it like they told their friends they 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 let us know that they were proud of us while they were alive and I think that's important it's so important yeah. because some some parents don't do that. So that's right. wonderful. That is wonderful. Now, I'm always curious to know, so what what was the catalyst? Like what made you decide I'm going to write a memoir? Um so when when mommy passed, um it was surprising. We knew that she had some illnesses. We knew she had, you know, high blood pressure, arthritis, the things that elderly, you know, people have, our parents have. And, but when, when she passed, it was sudden. So 
Luckily for me, my aunt, Juliet, had called me the night before and gave me a chance to speak with her. And she could hardly speak, but I said, oh, mommy, don't worry, I'm coming. My book, ticket's book. We can go eat in San Fernando. We can do all these great things. I was basically telling her about dates that we would go on when I would come down to Trinidad. But she passed a few hours later. Oh. And so that morning when I got the phone call, and that's how the book opens, I get this phone call from my cousin in Boston. And my cousin says, um, I have to tell you something. And I'm like, yeah, sure. What's going on? And she's like, um, mommy passed last night. I was like, no, mommy's fine. I spoke with her. We made plans for, and so it, it was such a shock. Um, and so here I am in Kingston getting ready for a funeral that I didn't really think I would be attending. And of course this is happening during Parang season. And this is the most important season for my family. Um, and a Parang is really, a Christmas carol, um, but it's done Caribbean style with a huge band. And the importance of a parang is that the band doesn't tell you when they're coming. So at three in the morning, you hear the sound <laughs> of the mandolin and the guitar and the maracas, which I can play. And that tells you, wake up, get ready, get the house ready, get the food ready because the, the the musicians have been traveling for several days and you need to feed them, clothe them, give them rest, and you need to party and revel with them to celebrate the season. Wow. So, yeah, so that's what a parang is. It's just a real fancy way of saying a Caribbean caroling uh, thing. <laughs> so, so I'm with my granddad and we're in his bedroom and of course, at this point, I know that I'm a writer, but I'm not prepared to tell the world I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, you know, daddy, I really want to write something about mommy. And I think I'm going to write a book about her, about her life, because I'm there. She hasn't been buried yet. And I'm there thinking, gosh, I feel like she was snatched away mm -hmm. from us so soon, so suddenly. Yeah. And what what a book can do is a book can tell everybody what this relationship was like in a way that I can't say it because I write better than, than I speak. And so fast forward to when my granddad was about to pass and he was on his deathbed. He says to me, what about the book? <laughs> he does. Right. And I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> you remember <laughs> He's like, yeah, what's going on with it? And I said, okay, it's done. I'm writing the book about her. Oh, that's so, incredible. He was totally yeah. into it. He was into it. And I remember because he had suffered a stroke. And when I heard his voice, I knew. I mean, I know my parents. I know my grandmother. I know my granddad. I knew he wouldn't live very much longer. And he was alive for about seven days after that phone call. And I started reading the first chapter to him over the phone because oh. I knew that if I read that first, those first couple of lines, he may not be alive to, to, to read the book or hear the, the audio, but if he could hear how I'm setting it up about Mammy's funeral, then that will give him some comfort in terms of his transition. So, yeah. He, that <laughs> must've meant the world to him. How wonderful that you got to do that. Thank you. I'm glad I did only because I feel like I don't have any regrets. Like I wish in a way, I wish my grandmother knew, yeah. but her passing is what, what precipitated the book. Mm -hmm. So the fact that my dad knew yeah. is really, really special for me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Because you know, sometimes writers, when you're in that initial stage, you don't want to share with anyone. So right. that was that was so brave and so wonderful. And I am so sorry for your loss too. Your, your parents just sound and like amazing. <laughs> they Thank really you. do. They were, they were awesome. And um, the best thing that happened to me was them being able to raise me. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it sounds like you were, a wonderful <clears throat> gift to them too. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, Anita, in your book, you write about being, you know, born in Canada and and also your formative years in Trinidad and Tobago. 
And yeah. you talk about the um, the third space. Can you expand upon this for our viewers, please? Sure. Um, I, I I think this is a very uh, common thing for, I would say, first generation, second generation Canadians. Uh, many of us, I was born in Canada, but I'm from immigrant parents. And so my biological mother came to Canada when she was uh, 16 and she uh, got pregnant with me, couldn't take care of me. She was so young. And then my grandparents stepped in and said, you know, send her to Trinidad, bring her. We we will help help you look after her. So that was the best gift that I could have been given in terms of my life. But when I came back to Canada, I, I always knew I was Canadian, even though I was living in the Caribbean. And growing up, I always felt like I wasn't Canadian enough, but I also knew that I wasn't Trinidadian because in Trinidad, you're, you're Trinidadian if you're born in Trinidad. If you're not born there, everyone sees you as being something else, even though I was born and, and spent most of my formative years there. And so coming back to Canada and growing up here, it felt as though I couldn't see my culture I couldn't see Trinidadian culture. Mm -hmm. And by extension, I couldn't see Black culture. I couldn't see Caribbean culture. But at the same time, if I went back home, uh, Canadian culture just seemed so foreign to everyone on the one hand, but it was something that everyone aspired to. It's like, oh, we want to go away. We want to go to Canada to work, or we want to go to Florida to live, or we want to go to New York to live. There was always this aspiration. Um, and I think this aspiration has to do with social inequality. It has to do with us leaving this world behind so that we can have a better life. And in many Caribbean families, women will leave and work as, as in my family, work as nannies for many years, and then send all of that funding back to Trinidad so that our the children can have a little bit more. Now, this is not everybody. Obviously, there are many different social class levels um, in Trinidad. But in my family, there was a little bit of that. And I believe that in Canada, we don't quite speak enough about this complexity around feeling like you belong in two places or three places and then feeling as though you don't belong to those places at all. And, and that is something that hasn't been resolved in my life. It's still something that I am working through. When my daughter Kennedy was born, I started identifying as Black Canadian. Prior to Kennedy being born, I identified as, well, you know, I'm kind of Trinidadian and I'm kind of Canadian. As soon as Kennedy was born, I said, you know what? No, I need to belong to Canada at some point. I cannot be Canadian and always be from somewhere else, because if that's the case, we can never claim Canada as Black people who are born here. And there are Black Canadians who can claim Canada for eight generations, but yet as Canadians, we're always asking people of color, where are you from? No, but where are you really from? No, 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 but you said Nova Scotia, but where were you from before that? And when my daughter was born, so my, my daughter was born in Kingston, her father is probably third or fourth generation Canadian. And I want Kennedy to know that her mother, obviously first generation Canadian, but I'm still Canadian. I do not, I, I have to stop doing this thing where because I'm black, I must be from somewhere else. And so my daughter's birth was almost the catalyst for me saying, you know what? I'm a black Canadian woman. And I'm going to claim this identity, even if it makes other people feel uncomfortable, because that is really not my issue. I am Black Canadian of Caribbean heritage. And that's it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I I love that you're claiming it and that everything is coming together. Like, like do you, do you yes. feel that writing your novel also helped... Um, kind of make the space seem a little smaller, your third space? I think writing um, the memoir made me commit to things. It made me ask myself really difficult questions. And something I write about in the memoir is that I'm in a love affair with Canada. It's a love triangle. Yeah. It's a love triangle in the sense that 
I love Canada, but there are times when I feel that Canada doesn't love me back. And one of the examples that I give is years ago, we had um, the Olympics, the Winter Olympics held in Vancouver. And I remember watching the opening ceremonies and I was so excited. And there were like indigenous dancers and there was something about the bear and in the prairies and they had fishes and fish in the Pacific. And, And I was waiting for a representation of me. I was like, there's nothing about Carabana. There's nothing about the Black experience. There's the only Black representation that I saw was Mikhail Jean. And at that time, she was she had her formal role. But it hurt me so much to see that when we told the world who we were as a country, I wasn't there. How, how, how could you not include me when I was born here? And so I started writing about it's unrequited love. It's I love you. I claim you. I love coming back here. I love living here. But when you tell the world who you really are, you talk about the Mounties, you talk about hockey, you talk about maple syrup, but you don't talk about the Black experience. But when it's convenient, when Carabana brings in, as an example, millions of dollars to the economy oh you love me then but really once you have the funds we're forgotten as per usual and that is something that I don't see people talking about and I speak about this openly in the book because again I feel like at this point if I'm going to leave a legacy for my daughter and for other Canadians I would love for us to engage in this topic more meaning if we're here and we are citizens how are we going to be made to feel whole in this country? And what does that look like? Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> you, you, Anita, you, you actually just left me speechless. Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, it, it, I think it's something, it, it's so important in Canada we're made up of so many different cultures. We are a diverse nation and it's so important that everyone feels like they belong. So- Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I I will say one more thing. Yes. It is is not a cut and dry situation. So I will travel, right? We've been to Europe. I've been to the Caribbean. I've been to Mexico. I'll travel and then I'll come home. And the minute the plane touches down, I'm like, oh God, so happy to be Canadian. So happy to be born here. So happy to be in this country. And then a couple of weeks will go by and something will happen. And then I'll, gosh, you know, it's really tough sometimes to be black here. It's really tough sometimes. And I'm living in the United States right now because I'm working here. But there's a way in which Blackness is expected in America because of their history. Yeah. And because Blackness is expected, here's what happens for me. I go into a store here and people are like, oh, hi, how are you? What what can I help you with? You know, um, you know, and also how, how are you doing? How was your day? Because Blackness is not a surprise. <laughs> in Canada, I will go into like, let's say I travel to a small, a small town. Oh, God. Blackness becomes a surprise. And now, instead of, oh, hi, how are you? Now I'm met with suspicion. I am Mm -hmm. met with scorn. I am met with, let me follow her, even though I'm not telling her I'm following her. Let me just pretend like I'm fixing the shelves. I'm like, "Mm, I think I can afford that. Mm, Yeah, let's not worry about that. I can afford that. Okay. But the point I'm making is there's a stark difference for me living in Canada versus living in the United States, because in the United States, I'm not saying it's better. The United States has social ills that we cannot even begin to speak about (laughs) that Canada does not have. Let's just put that out there. But there's a way in which when I'm walking down the street in America, there's a way in which people aren't crossing the street. People aren't holding their purses. People oh. aren't pretending they didn't see me. And that's the Canadian experience oh. for me. Pretending you don't see me, saying hello to everybody else. I'm doing grocery shopping and I, you, you are talking to everyone else, small talk as you do their groceries. But the minute I show up to the, 
to get my groceries done, all of a sudden you do not see me and I'm not a person. Or you take my cold cuts and you fling them at me because I'm not even good enough for you to hand it to, right? Uh. So I feel like I feel like there are parts of the Black experience in Canada that so many of us, we hide it, we speak about it behind closed doors, we whisper yeah. about it because we're so afraid and so hurt by it that it's just not something we want to deal with at all times. And, and I felt like it was time for me to step out and say, we need to do something about the Black experience in Canada because it is hurting us. And in some cases, you know, making us not well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, your your memoir will certainly be eye-opening, you know, for many Canadians. Because, we, you know, we, li- we like to think that everything's perfect here. So, I mean, my goodness. And I, I just, how, I mean, you are a highly educated, very, very successful woman. Um, and this is the world that you're navigating. So how, for lack of a, a of a better thing to ask here, but how do you say how do you stay strong, Anita? Like my God. Um, you know, I I know that there's no perfect place. Yeah. Um, Trinidad has its issues. America has its issues. I live in New York City. I live on the Upper West Side. Uh, there are issues where I live right now, and there will be issues in Canada. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make peace with the parts of Canada that still need work in the sense of no country is going to be perfect. And I will always have an allegiance to Canada because it's where I'm from. It's where, you know, my daughter was born and Canada will always be home. But right now in my life, rather than staying in Canada and being angry, I am looking forward to exploring Uh, and traveling more and seeing, you you know, what other places have to offer, knowing that I can always come back to this safety, uh, for lack of a better term, and knowing that even with that safety, there are pieces that I will probably never um, be happy with. But, But I have to come to terms with like, let me live with this, right? That's where I, that's where I am right now. I'm not going to throw away Canada. I'm not going to throw away the baby with the bathwater. I'm going to try my best to keep what I need and to keep what my daughter needs. Yeah. And then with everything else say, okay, I get it. I've got, I have to live with that. And that's, that's where I've landed on that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I hope that we get our shit together. Like, I mean, <laughs> like, I, think, I, think, I think, you know what? I think we're on our way. I must say some, a word that hasn't come up yet is politeness. And this is something that runs through the memoir. Mm-hmm. And I use politeness to, to juxtapose the cruelty, right? Because we're so polite mm-hmm. and racism is so cruel. Racism is the most cruel thing that a person can experience. And, and people won't tell you that, but it is the truth. It is very cruel. And mm-hmm. the politeness and the cruelty together, that's, sometimes feels like Canada. And so I think that we need to tackle the politeness first before we can tackle everything else because the politeness, what I, what I call it is being stabbed in the back while you're smiling with me. So you're taking the knife and you're just getting it in there, but you're smiling and saying we're friends. And that's what racism kind of feels like. It's this odd, it's trauma. That's what it is. Um, And so I think as Canadians, we pride ourselves on being polite, but it's that politeness that enables us to pretend that the pain isn't always also there. And I think if we start with the politeness Mm -hmm. and we start stripping away at why we need this politeness at all times, I think that's when we will get further ahead in terms of discussing issues of race. Yeah, it, it's the un- uncomfortable conversation, uncomfortable conversations that need to be had. Exactly. And Agreed. I am, I am so sorry. This is your experience. Like, I'm just so sorry. And I admire you so much, Anita. Thank you. I really Thank you. do. Thank um, you. We should probably end with one more question here. You've got written this incredible memoir, 
what would you like viewers, like readers to walk away with? What message would you like them to? Um, so this memoir is about my grandmother. It's about my life with her, but it's also about being black in Canada. And um, I would love for viewers to walk away knowing that we should really date our mothers more than, than, than we do. We should prepare for dating our mothers in the way that we prepare for a date with a, with a male or a female. And if I could, if I could get one thing back, you know, that thing would be just to have five minutes with my grandmother, just five minutes. And I would give up everything that I own for those five minutes, but I can't get those five minutes back. So my message is, let's date our mothers, men and women as people, let's date our mothers, let's take them out. Let's find out like, what was your life like? What was your childhood like? What was it like when you went to school, you know, um, when you got married, when you had your first child, like what made you tick? What were you angry about? And I, I feel that those stories and those formal dates just sitting across from each other, just really getting to know our mothers will really go a long way when in fact, at some point they will no longer be with us. And that's just the reality. And if I could do something over, I would have formally dated my grandmother more and taken her out on more dates just to just to get to know who she was as a woman um, and not just as my mommy. So that that's my message uh, for for the memoir. Yay. So viewers, let's call our moms. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Date time. <laughs> I can do it now. <laughs> oh, that's and Nina, it has been such a pleasure chatting with you. I've I've really enjoyed it. I could keep you here much longer. <laughs> but I better let you go to work. So <laughs> uh thank you for having me. It thank is you. An Mind. absolute pleasure. So, and <laughs> viewers, thank you so much for watching. I will put links down below with all of the information uh, where you can find Anita's book and uh, with details of when it will be available as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>